Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Lena Wen, an innovative leader and proven problem solver who has taken on a number of the most pressing challenges in public health today. Dr. Wen is an emergency room physician and a research professor of health policy and management at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. But you may know her best as a contributing columnist for the Washington Post, where she writes a weekly column and anchors the newsletter, The Checkup with Dr. Wen. Or you may know her as the medical analyst on CNN with, with frequent appearances also on NPR. Like all COVID commentators, Dr. Wen has drawn her share of criticism, but she continues to share her recommendations on how to tackle this public health crisis. Our event today focuses on the personal experiences that have shaped Dr. Wen's career, which she so beautifully describes in her book, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. Let me just share with you three brief observations about Dr. Wen's vision and values. First, her own life trajectory has trans been, was transformed by social services, which inspired her passionate commitment for the field of public health. Her family emigrated to the United States from China when she was just seven years old. Arriving in California with $40, $40 to their name. Her parents worked multiple jobs and at times her father depended on food stamps to survive. She graduated from college at the age of 18 and then earned two master's degrees from University of Oxford where she was a Rhodes Scholar and a medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine. Second point, Dr. Wen has long been a powerful advocate for health equity. At the young age of eight, she witnessed a child from an undocumented family die from an asthma attack. Her family was afraid to call for help. She learned that our society treats people very differently depending on who they are and where they come from and she has worked tirelessly to address such inequities. And finally, my third point, Dr. Wen was focus, has focused intently on problem solving. As Baltimore's health commissioner, for instance, she reshaped the conversation around the national opioid crisis by giving every city resident access to naloxone which can reverse an overdose without needing a prescription. This single act of action, con considered radical at the time, saved more than 3,000 lives. Now, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Leonard Marcus, who is the founding co-director of the National Preparedness and Leadership Initiative here which is a joint program for the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Center for Public Leadership. Dr. Um, Wen, welcome to our program. And I'd love to now turn over the podium, the virtual podium to you, Lenny. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Williams. And thank you, Dr. Wen, uh, for joining us here in our discussion today. Um, I must say that I loved reading your book, uh, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. And what the book does is tell your life story and then translates how that life story turned into your public health passion. And so I thought we could begin today talking about your origin story. What is it about your early life that led you into public health and into public health leadership with such passion. Lena? 
Well, Lenny, Professor Marcus, it's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you very much for moderating. And I also want to give my sincere thanks and appreciation to Dean Williams. Thank you for your incredible leadership. You are such an inspiration for all of us. I have learned much from you over the years and really appreciate your steadfast um, leadership at the um, at, at the uh, at the Harvard Chan School. So, um, Lenny, you you ask a an, a a good question and one that I actually hadn't in intended to write about. Um, the you, you mentioned very kindly about Lifelines, my, my new book, and I actually meant to write this book about my work, our work in Baltimore, because there are so many great stories about um, how people overcame so many different challenges to do what's right for our city. I wanted to share the successes that we had as inspiration for others and, and, and also to lift up the great work that public health practitioners do every single day. But it was in writing Lifelines that I also reflected on my own journey and how, as Dean Williams very kindly mentioned about my own origin story about um, coming to the U.S. as an immigrant, um, how our family depended on Medicaid and food stamps and public housing and, um, and how, in a way, my own story is a story of public health. That for us, these are not entitlements. The safety nets that we had access to are what enabled me and my younger sister to pursue our dreams. And it's this understanding that I saw early on through the story Dean Williams uh, referred to of watching a young child die in front of me um, when I was a child myself, that very much gave me the, the, the impetus to pursue work in healthcare and ultimately in public health. And one of the stories that really moved me, uh, Lena, was um, your experience in the emergency room and then how you translated that experience into a public health commitment. Uh, could you ex tell us a little bit more about how you made that shift in your own thinking and then how that translated into your leadership in public health? Yeah, I never meant to be in public health, as in, um, and I should be careful how I say this because I was giving a lecture to a group of students at a school of public health, and I think it came off sounding like there's no point in getting a public health degree. That's not at all what I mean to say, but rather that I never thought that that was a career that um, that was even even existed. I just knew that what I wanted to do was to be a physician. I wanted to care for those who otherwise would not be able to get care. This is why I became an emergency physician specifically, because I didn't want to ever be in a position where I had to turn someone away because of lack of health insurance, because they couldn't pay, because of where they happened to come from. But it was also from working in the ED that I saw what happens when people are here seeking medical care, not just because of a health issue or a medical issue that we could solve within the four walls of the hospital, but that their lives were impacted by so many things. I mean, I remember this young boy, for example, that I saw coming in all the time because of asthma, but he didn't need a better inhaler. What was happening was that he and his mother were experiencing homelessness. They were going in between different shelters where people around them smoked. At some point, they lived across the street from an incinerator. They were then in a row house that was full of mold. I mean, we could do all the right things when it comes to medical interventions, but what determined how well and how long he lived, the quality of his life and his mother's and his family's life were all about what we in public health know as the social determinants of health. But I really had no concept of this in my medical training. Things are a lot different um, now. I think we are teaching the concepts of public health in a different way. But that's why I felt so strongly about doing advocacy work, about working within my community, because I saw all these issues that I thought I was going into medicine to solve, but I wasn't able to do them within the walls of the hospital. You know, in reading the book, it, it's really clear that your experience in the emergency department uh, put you in a position where you always have to make a decision. You always have to do something. And then you get uh, to Baltimore into the Department of Public Health, and there's uh, uh, a bit of a uh, split. On one hand, let's solve all the big problems. Then on the other hand, we have day-to-day -day problems right here that we can make significant progress on. And you describe how you created a balance between the big problems and the pragmatic solutions. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Lenny. And um, I think what happens often in public health, in whenever we talk about social determinants, it, everything is by definition connected to something else, right? That health is not just about the healthcare you receive, it's also about housing, about food, about the air that you breathe, about social economic um, par parameters and so forth. I think sometimes when people hear that, they understand it as a type of decision paralysis. As in, when there are so many things that impact each other, where do I even begin? The mayor who appointed me to my role in Baltimore, Mayor Stephanie Rowling Blake, used to say that if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And the way that I interpret this in clinical work also is if a patient comes in and there's a lot of things going on. I mean, this patient, let's say, is unresponsive, but you find that this patient has heart disease and a history of cancer and diabetes. I mean, and may have been in a car accident. You don't just throw up your hands and say, well, so many things are happening. I'm not going to do anything. I mean, that's never an answer. And so I bring that same sense of urgency into the work in public health. Yes, everything is related to one another. But what is the one thing that I can do right now? This short term change, if you will, on the way to long term action. So I'll give a couple of examples of this. We um, had a study that found that more than 10,000 of our children in Baltimore, school children in Baltimore needed something as basic as glasses, but didn't have them. Now, I don't need another study to tell me that if kids can't see, they can't read and may even end up being labeled as being disruptive when all they need is a pair of glasses. I don't mean to say that getting kids glasses is the solution to every educational disparity and, 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 and poor health that's out there, but this is a solvable problem. And so we ended up setting up a partnership with Johns Hopkins, Warby Parker, a national um, uh, pr uh, nonprofit called Vision to Learn, and we set up a program that would do vision screenings and then provide glasses to children right in their schools so that the kids don't have to miss school, caregivers don't have to miss work. We did it free of charge. And that's something that, again, is a tangible example of something that we can do right now. Um, we also worked a lot on the opioid crisis. And again, you know, I think there is there is long term change, right? We know that we need a lot more treatment for the disease of addiction and that that ultimately is what will will um, will will will, will um, that ultimately is what we need. However, I also knew that if I had come in, and by the by the way, I was appointed in 2014, so this is a very different time compared to 2021. But at that time, there was and still is so much stigma, especially around treatment. And so I knew that if I came into the city and said, my number one priority is to increase addiction services, everyone would understand that as I wanted to uh, uh, build more methadone clinics. And because of the nimbyism, the not in my backyard, I would have lost everyone from the start. And so instead, I came in and said, what is something that we can get behind? And that was naloxone, the opioid antidote, also called Narcan. If we can get people to understand that we need to save a life now, that also helps to change the narrative that addiction is actually a disease and that recovery is possible, that treatment exists. And so we ended up getting legislation changed. Dean Williams alluded to this earlier. We got legislation changed such that um, I was able to issue a standing order, a blanket prescription for everyone in our city to get Narcan. Um, essentially making it over the counter. We also did trainings for um, more than 30,000. We did more than 30,000 trainings over the course of three years. And as a result, everyday residents saved the lives of more than 3,000 people in Baltimore within a three-year period. Every one of those lives obviously matters very much. But also, I would um, I would say that that's an example, too, of how something short term is able to get us and galvanize a lot more attention to these issues. And then we were able to also increase treatment. We worked with all of our hospitals so that to um, to have what we called levels of care, just like you have levels of care for trauma. We did levels of care for addiction treatment. We also started a first of its kind 24 seven ER for addiction and mental health in our city called a stabilization center. I mean, all those things were possible though, because we paved the way with something that was a lot more politically feasible. And we demonstrated that that short term action was necessary for long term um, for for long term re, re, re results. Well, you know, as you were as I was reading through, I noticed what you did was you created alliances. Um, you understood what each of the different uh, players, stakeholders was looking for. You sometimes brought trainings and Narcan to those meetings. 
Can you talk a little bit about how to create those alliances because that's how you create big change. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point um, is that you can't go about the work alone. But I also think that building alliances means that, and this is my point of view, I, I should state that from, from the start, that um, people approach this work in different ways. And so I, I'm not saying that this is the way that everybody should, should be doing the work. Um, it also really depends on the position that you're in. And in a position as the health commissioner of the city, you do want to try to be as inclusive as possible to people who come from different from different viewpoints. But I also come to this work as a public health pragmatist in that even if um, I don't agree 100% with an organization and their mission, if I'm able to find a topic that we can work together on, I am very happy to work with them on that topic, understanding that we do not agree on everything. So as, as an example, one of, the, um, one of the, the collaborations that I was the most proud of in Baltimore was our work around safe streets, which is modeled after Cure Violence first started in Chicago, the idea of community violence interruption, um, that violence is a, that we need to treat violence as a contagious illness, and it certainly needs to be approached from a public health per perspective. Um, we had collaborations with um, with many entities, including um, including Catholic charities, including many of our nonprofits in, in, in the city at a point when we were about to lose funding for Safe Streets and for one of our other very successful programs called Be More for Healthy Babies. That program, by the way, reduced infant mortality in our city by 38 percent in a seven year period. At the time that we were about to lose funding for these key priorities, I called upon people to help to um, um, who we may have been disagreeing with. I mean, the Catholic Church at that time was actually suing the health department because of our stance on abortion and on a piece of legislation that that, that we had that at the time required for um, these um, pregnancy resource centers um, to say that they actually were not offering the full range of reproductive options. So we were actually getting sued by the Catholic Church. However, we wanted to work together with the Catholic Church on these issues of in, um, of uh, be more for healthy babies and safe streets, and so we were able to um, to build a, our collaborations on specific topics while understanding that we may not agree on others. And again, not everybody takes that approach, but to me, that kind of um, of collaboration understanding that we are here for the broader picture, that public health is about all of these issues, um, I think is, I think that's important, again, depending on the position that you have. If you're an advocate working for an advocacy organization, maybe you take a different approach. But for us in um, local public health, where funding is so limited, where you need all the partners that, that you can get, I do think that those types of, um, of collaborations are necessary. Well, that I think is one of the strengths of your leadership approach, which is you find common ground with people that are otherwise in uh, conflict with one another, and then you build off that common ground. That's right. And it is also looking at helping people to understand what's in it for them. I mean, I hate to quite put it so bluntly as this, but, you know, everybody has their priorities. And I don't mean that this is a selfish priority, but rather every organization has their mission, right? Or politicians or people serving the public. I mean, they have their constituency that that they are serving. And so you need to understand what what is their goal and then see how can you align your goal with theirs? Because almost maybe not every time, but most of the time, there's some kind of Venn diagram where there is something that you can push for, uh, for, for, for together. And I know that's something, Lani, that you also teach a lot of. And I think that type of leadership, um, swarm leadership of, of looking for common ground is, is really important. Well, um, I, I actually found it fascinating in reading the book because you brought such imagination to finding where that common ground is because it was never obvious. Now I'm going to ask you a tough question. Um, you, you led up to a number of different political figures while you were in Baltimore, uh, some of whom you had common ground with, you know, politically in line with you, some of them very, very different. And those relationships were critical to what you were able to accomplish in, in Baltimore. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to lead up? Because this is one of the puzzles of our time in getting through COVID. 
That's right. And here I'm I'm going to offer my view, which again, I understand that not everyone is going to uh, to 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 agree with. And I welcome people to push back and give their own uh, and give their own examples. Um, let me um, let me give you an example of something that um, that I really had to wrestle with. And um, I, I mentioned that I was appointed by by one mayor, by Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake, and then she decided to not run for re-election, and somebody else, a then state senator, um, became the mayor, um, uh, Mayor Catherine Pugh. I knew because I had worked with, um, with with her as a state senator that she had views on public health that those of us practitioners in public health would find unconventional. Um, and in particular, um, I was very worried about some of the positions that she had stated specifically around addiction. Um, not long after she became mayor, and by the way, I had already been there for a couple of years and had already put addiction, treating addiction as one of my top priorities. And so not long after she became mayor, she made a statement to the press. And so this is all public information that um, if she had a child who had addiction, she would buy this child a one way ticket to Timbuktu and not have them come back until they're quote unquote cured. Obviously, that is not the way that we see addiction, right? We believe in treating addiction in the community, just like we would treat asthma or diabetes or any other illness. And so it, many advocates were very upset about this rightfully. I mean, it was rightful that they called it a stigma, that they called it a stigmatizing comment. And they also wanted me to, as somebody who is an advocate for people with addiction, to call out the mayor and say, this is wrong. Here's why it's wrong. This is what we're doing. I knew, though, that with a new mayor who had just come in, that if I made that kind of statement, even if I wouldn't be fired immediately, which could certainly happen, I would lose all credibility with the mayor. I wouldn't be able to actually do the things that I wanted to do. And what was my obligation to our residents? What was my obligation to my team? I mean, I had to try to fix this from within rather than as an advocate. Now, again, as an advocate, you could do one thing, right. but as someone working within the, the, the administration, you need to take a different approach. And so what I ended up doing was I recognized that at that point in time, I was not the most trusted messenger to the mayor on the issue of addiction. Clearly not, because she wasn't saying what I was at, what I had wanted her to say, but I knew others who were. And so what I did was I asked the head of our equivalent of the Chamber of Commerce in Baltimore. It's the Greater Baltimore Co Committee, a gentleman named Don Fry, who also was a state senator but, 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 but before. I asked him and the head of Catholic Charities, Bill McCarthy. I knew both of them were very trusted by the mayor. I asked them to co-lead a work group on drug treatment access and neighborhood re relations in our city. What Lena is describing is extraordinary in that rather than seeing people as enemies and friends, it was a matter of then how do you create, how do you bring people together to turn those who might be on the other side of the fence into friends and into allies? That's that, that that's exactly right. It's also, I think, a way of recognizing something that we say in public health a lot, which is that it's about the messenger as much as it's about the message. Right. And so if you recognize that you are not the most trusted messenger, how can you get others on board? And how can you also, speaking to your point, Lenny, about, um, about managing up or leading up, mm -hmm. how can you make it so that it's their idea and not your idea? And that was really important in this case. If I had gone to the mayor and said, you are wrong. And this is why we need to change um, this this perspective. That's not going to be effective, um, as opposed to um, as as opposed to um, to to making the case that um, that it's this is your idea. You are leading this work group. You are leading the change that we need in the city. So, Lena, if we were if we were to uh, change our focus now to COVID, of course, COVID has put a a spotlight on our public health infrastructure, um, what works, what needs to work a lot better. Um, if you were to imagine a vastly improved public health system on the other side of this massive public health crisis that we're facing in the world, what would public health look like in your future? There is the realistic answer, and then there's the answer, or there is the optimal answer, and then there right. is the the um, the the realistic answer. I mean, obviously, what I would love, I think, what all of us would love, is a world where health is not a 
privilege. It is a right for everyone. Um, we would love to see uh, a system that prioritizes equity, that focuses on the most vulnerable and overcoming disparities. I would love to see actually paying attention to the social determinants of health and not just giving lip service to it. Um, and I would also love to see adequate funding for public health. I mean, so that local public health isn't always about robbing Peter to pay Paul, which is what it feels like all the time, that whenever there's an emergency, you cut from something else in order to in order to work on on this new emergency, but all these other things that were crises before get left by the wayside. And so, I I would love to see that. Um, in, in terms of what's realistic, I actually think that we are at a point at an inflection point of sorts in the country. I mean, we are getting to the point where COVID looks more endemic. I mean, even if it's not actually endemic, because people are moving on from it. I think there is an opportunity to reimagine what public health looks like going forward, and it's going to depend on the part of the country. There are parts of the country where public health is now thought in a very positive way and where there's a lot more funding to the issue. I think those places need to lead the way to um, to to um, to there's a lot more funding coming to, to public health to see what is it? What can this good? What can a really strong public health system look like to the points that I mentioned earlier, looking at social determinants, looking at equity, etc. I think there are a lot of other parts of the country where public health is really um, in a much worse position than it was at the beginning of the pandemic, because unfortunately, it's been put squarely in the midst of culture wars. I wish that weren't the case. OK, just to state, right? I wish that were not the case. But we have to be realistic and recognize that that has happened, that public health has become in the middle of partisan wars. And I would recommend for people who are there, for the public health leaders who are there, actually to pivot away from COVID. Recognizing it, it shouldn't be the case. But if COVID has become so politicized, pivot away from that issue and work on other things that can bring your community closer together, including issues on mental health, opioid addiction, food access, senior care. I mean, there's an endless array of other public health topics that could be more unifying. Alina, you've been a marvelous translator of public health to the community in your column in the Washington Post, in your comments on CNN. Um, and of course, what you have to translate changes by the week and sometimes even by the day. And given where we are today, what would you see as some of the priorities? What do we need to be focusing on? And then how do we go through the transitions that are gonna be facing us on a day-to-day -day basis going forward? It's challenging. And what I would say is that there is a different answer for what policymakers should be doing versus what we are advising individuals. And so yesterday I, I was I was in clinic and the advice that I give to my patients is very different than the policy guidance that I would be giving when speaking to a broader audience. When speaking to our patients, the advice is very individualized. I mean, for example, just because mandates for masking are being dropped doesn't mean that somebody else, that everybody needs to go ripping off their mask, right? That the level of precautions that we take will be very different going forward. And I think we have the ability on an individual level to tailor that guidance to people to meet to to meet them where they are. That's very different guidance than what we would give to the public. I mean, I think this is why it's so challenging. Um, the CDC, for example, has a very difficult job or local and um, health, health officials have a very difficult job because they're trying to do as much good as they can for everyone. But I think the biggest challenge right now is meeting the moment. I mean, I have been quite critical of the CDC, especially over the last few weeks, about um, about how they're not meeting the moment. I mean, when 70% of the country is saying that they're done with COVID. Look, I understand the COVID is not done with us, right? It's it, it's the truth that like the virus, we are still having very high levels of virus. Our hospitalization levels are still nationwide around where they were in the middle of the Delta surge. I mean, it's clearly a major problem. But public health depends on public trust. And if the CDC or other public health agencies are not reading the room, if they're still giving guidance that's totally disconnected from where the American people are as a whole, then that's eroding public trust. And that's going to lead to a much bigger problem down the line. Again, I think different on the individual level because you can meet people where they are individually. But I would also say that as policymakers, there's also a need to, yes, balance the needs of everyone, 
but you also have to recognize that you need to meet the moment of where people are at that at that point in time. Yeah, and that's as, as complicated as it gets. So um, just for a moment, looking back at the bigger public health uh, picture, um, how do we re-engage uh, the country on other public health issues such as obesity, mental health, pediatric health equity? Um, so many issues uh, that have been put on the side burner right now that we need to get back uh, on the front burner. How do we make this transition? You know, again, this is one where I wish we didn't have to make a choice. Right, I, I wish, and I had just written an, an op-ed, uh, my last op-ed in the Post this week was exactly about this, that we have a major problem. I mean, uh, again, I want, I want to speak on the individual level as well as on the policy level. We have a, a lot of patients who still to them, their number one pressing priority is COVID, which you know under, it's understandable. We've been talking nonstop about COVID for the last two years, it's understandable. However, if, if there's a patient who is vaccinated and boosted, their chance of dying from COVID is very low, especially unless they are severely immunocompromised. Again, I, I want to work with them on their risk of COVID, but if the same person doesn't want to go to um, get a mammogram, is too afraid to go to their dentist, is not paying attention to their congestive heart failure, I mean, Things are out of proportion. And clinically, we need to help people to understand the risk, their actual risk from COVID, and then how to balance all the other aspects of their health too. Mental health. I mean, so many people have mental health issues as a result of isolation, addiction. I mean, overdose numbers have climbed. You know, we need to pay attention to people's overall health. And I think that same thing applies to public health too. Do I wish that we have unlimited resources for public health or even more resources for public health so we can do all these things? Absolutely. But that's not reality. Already, so many local public health officials have quit their jobs. A staffing is a major problem in health departments. There's is and there and also um, and also there is a lot of funding right now before a limited period of time. And so, it's really difficult to tell people you have an emergency that's ongoing into year three, and also you need to work on obesity and also into opioids. So we have to prioritize again. If everything's a priority, nothing is a priority. I wish that weren't the case, but I do think a pivot is needed because we need to recognize that good health is not just about infection control, and good health is not just about the absence of COVID. Thank you. Well, before um, uh, we put this event together, we um, asked students to submit questions for you. So let's start with Nakisa Sadeki, uh, who is studying health policy here at Harvard Chan. She asks, you've often said that it's not enough just to get the science right. We've got to, during the pandemic, and we've seen during the pandemic that it's just as important to deliver the right message. How can we communicate public health messages so they resonate and make an impact? Well, I appreciate the question and also want to give a shout out to Nakisa, who I have known for a long time since she was a um, a pre-med student. I think I first met her when she was a sophomore in, in college um, and she came to work with me at the Baltimore City Health Department and has just been a, a, an incredibly um, stellar, exceptional person. And so I'm glad to um, I'm glad to hear her, her question channeled through you, Lenny. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some of the issues we talked about already, which is meeting people where they are, and that includes with timing, um, uh, going through credible messengers. Um, I, I would also say that um, that you know, as we are, I, 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 as we are doing this work ourselves, I don't think that we should underestimate our own impact. As in, for example, we're talking to people about vaccines. I don't think we should underestimate the impact that each of us as individuals have in our lives. For those people who are clinicians, you are a trusted messenger to many of your patients. And sometimes it takes multiple iterations for people to hear the message from their relatives, from their doctor, from their nurse, from their um, from their barber in order for that message to, to, to hit home. Also, don't underestimate your influence as a member of the community, because there will be somebody in your life for whom you are the most trusted person. And that could be your niece. It could be your neighbor. It could be a colleague. And so I, I think that um, that the it is true that we need to work on all these other things about the timing and the message and, and so forth. But also don't underestimate your own role. Um, and um, and approach people with empathy and compassion where they are. 
Thank you. Our next question comes from Kim Buster Turner, who is studying health management at the Harvard Chan School. Uh, Kim asks, can you comment on the importance of public, private, and academic partnerships in shaping the future of public health? Absolutely, Kim. It's a great question. And I, I've talked a bit, a bit about the importance of partnership and collaboration earlier. I would say that it's even more important now going forward. And I have a concern here, which is that there is now a lot of funding in public health, which is, again, fantastic. And a lot of people pay attention to public health. But not all things are actually public health. And so I think what's going on now is a lot of entities that previously might not have seen themselves working in public health and actually aren't really doing public health work are saying that they're doing public health work in order to access new funding. Now, again, we may wish that that's not the case, but that is the case. And so how do we, how do we get this, how do we right size this and get this back on track? And I would say the way, one of the ways to do that um, is to, again, appeal to people's interests. How can we, so I would encourage people who are actually in public health, for example, local and state public health leaders um, or people working for public health entities, they should take the lead and say, what are the issues that actually our communities are identifying as the top priorities? Right. Start from where the communities are. What is what are the issues that really need to be addressed and then convene other people to figure out how to address these issues. Don't let others set the table. You know, it's people say, right, that if you're not invited to um, if, if you're not if you're not invited to to the table, uh, bring your chair to the table or something like that, like come come to the table, b invite yourself. I would also say that you should make your own table. And so um, don't let others set the agenda. Those of us in public health have an obligation to set the agenda for others um, and bring them along. And I'll give you an example of this. When I was the health commissioner in Baltimore, we frequently had members of the for profit community. Um, and uh, again, not saying that this is wrong for them to profit, but rather that you know, people who don't necessarily work in public health and see potential gain in working with public health approach us all the time for things. And usually it would sound something like this. We have a product. We think you'd be really interested in this. And this is why. And it was actually really annoying to have to answer all these messages, because if I don't respond to them, these people, some of them are major donors, they'll go to the mayor, they'll go to city council members, and I eventually have to respond to these people and say no, and then that would be awkward too. And so we actually reconfigured this and said and started and started something in our city called Tech Health, where we um, we said we want to we understand these people are well meaning, we can bring them to the table, they can offer things that we can't do as the health department. But we are going to be the ones who determine the priorities. So we came, we brought all these people together, engineers and startups and architects and people from all different sectors. And we said, here are our six questions. Some of those questions were things like, how do we alert people about fentanyl overdoses? How do we track um, um, cases of um, uh, of child abuse so that we can prevent child and infant mortality? I mean, we had specific questions and we said, Please, you all help us to figure out how to solve these questions. So, for example, um, there was a nonprofit called Code in the Schools that started working with some software companies, and they helped us to come up with a, um, a alert system for when there were fentanyl overdoses on our neighborhoods. That was a problem that we identified that they helped to solve. And so I think that kind of partnership where people are working towards a goal, but you are setting the table as the public health practitioner, I think that's the model or a model, at least for partnerships going forward. You know, uh, what, what impressed me uh, in, uh, in in that story and other stories in the book is many times we see public health in a nice little box. And what you did by bringing those others in, you extended the terrain of public health. And with that, you extended the impact of public health, which is critical. Right. And I think something else that um, that we often make the case for, too, is that you have to you have to talk about public health. I mean, other people who are not in the field, they don't understand it and it's not their fault, right? You can't fault it someone for not understanding everything and not thinking about your field. And so instead of bemoaning, oh my goodness, nobody cares about public health. 
why not make the case for them and make them care? So for example, if somebody cares about education, why not make the case that school health, if our children are hungry, if our children are missing school all the time because of asthma, they can't learn. But that's up to us to make that case. Or what about the tie to criminal justice, that um, when individuals experiencing homelessness are criminalized, or when we are treating addiction and mental health issues as, as crimes and moral failings, that's not actually helping anyone. I mean, can we make that case for others? And I think that that's, that ultimately is our obligation too. I totally agree. Let me ask the last question uh, from another one of our students, Boniface Hakzimana. Um, a Harvard medical student studying global health delivery. He asks, during a public health crisis, leaders have to make difficult decisions. Inaction is a decision as action itself. As a former health commissioner of Baltimore who lived with such experiences, what is your advice to public health leaders waiting to be tested? Hmm. That's such a great question. And I also love and very much appreciate um, what um, the questioner asked about in about inaction being a decision in and of itself, because waiting is also a decision. And I know this very well working in the emergency department, right? If a patient comes in, your decision to wait and not do something is just is going to determine just as much about what happens as if you do something. And so I very much appreciate that too. Um, I would say two things here. One is don't wait for the perfect opportunity. As in, I hear so many wonderful students and interns and fellows say, well, my dream is the following. And you should have your dreams. And I think that's wonderful to, to aim high and aim at whatever you want to be aiming for. But if your dream is to work on HIV in East Africa, why not do HIV work in your community right now? Don't wait until you have that perfect opportunity before you gain experiences now. I would also add that in my um, my past experiences, the things that actually were ended up being the the ones that I learned from the most were not necessarily the ones that I went into it thinking, oh, this is going to be the most terrific opportunity. Actually, the things that I ended up having the best um, the the best overall outcome are actually when I went to work for an individual, and it didn't it almost didn't matter what I did. As in, if I believe in a leader and their passion is medical education and mine isn't, I believe in this person and I will work on whatever this person is doing. That's how I will learn. And I gave so many examples of that in the book of individuals that I've learned from and, um, and the skills and the experiences came as a result of that. And so I think... You know, so there are a lot of people, again, a lot of um, people first entering their fields who will say, and again, I'm not saying don't do this, but they'll look at the organization, the mission of the organization, what they'll do on a day-to-day -day basis, and then they'll look at who are they going to be working with. I would challenge you to look at it backwards and say, who am I going to be working with first? And then do I, obviously, if you believe in the person, you're going to believe in the mission of what they do. And then the day-to-day falls into place after that. Hmm. Well, Lena, I have many thank yous for you. First off, I wanna thank you for all of the time and effort uh, that you invested in the book because it gives for all of us a story and an inspiration that we can follow. I, I wanna thank you for being a voice for public health uh, because that's not an easy job these days. And I wanna thank you uh, for joining us here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health your voice and your leadership inspires so many. So thank you for being part of our community and uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you very much, Lenny. I've learned so much from you over the years and I'm grateful to you for your guidance and also wanted to once again thank um, the, the School of Public Health as well as to thank Dean Williams for her leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you.